everything can be poisonous at certain doses and other things might not be. Think of homeopathic medicines. A lot of the times those are very toxic chemicals they put in there, but they dilute them down so much that your body cannot you know, put up any type of uh, you know, side effect to it. Um, another interesting thing we uh, need to consider uh, th certain venoms. People will inject diluted venoms into themselves to try to build resistance to snakes. As crazy as it is, I've had patients come up to me and tell me they are doing this. But um, you hear all kinds of things. But I think it's interesting to know uh, that um, medicine is a delicate balance between having something that's effective, but something that's not going to cause you a lot of side effects and harm. Um, and that's why they're prescriptions. They're dangerous drugs is how they're described. Uh, want to have that under supervision of a doctor and take it exactly how the uh, physician wants it and uh, to remain safe as possible. Um, just a, some of you healthcare professionals know what an adverse drug event, but that's whenever a drug can potentially cause harm to you. Um, I just wanted to give a couple of statistics to know how important this is. Um, one of the, these statistics, statistics <coughs> these are mostly avoidable, um, but Adverse drug events cause an average of 120,000 hospitalizations a year, 700,000 visits to the emergency room, and uh, uh, let's see, what else here? Um, adverse drug events in children less than five um, is the number one cause of, uh, of uh, adverse drug events. It's, it happens without the adult supervision. 53,000 children uh, with ages less than five years old are taken to the emergency department each year due to the consumption of medication and the absence of supervision. So that's a lot of accidental poisonings for children. Um, after, uh, I wanted to see, uh, maybe get some interaction with the uh, crowd to see uh, what types of things you believe you can do to help prevent accidental uh, child overdoses in the household. Can you come up with anything? Go ahead. Yes, I breach definitely not in uh, one thing is a refrigerator, maybe not in the door, but the top back where they cannot reach it or see it. Um, any other thoughts or ideas? Things to help protect children from accidental poisoning, poisonings? Those fancy lids that I can't open. Yes, <laughs> very important. I guess so. And you can imagine. Sometimes people use a pill box or they will take their medications out of a child safe bottle because they don't like that bottle. They want to put it in something else where they ask the pharmacy to make a child uh, uh, not safe for children. So you have to be very cautious when you're changing bottles, containers, pill boxes, um, things spilling on the ground by mistake, making sure that you're very, being very cautious when you have children in the house. Um, I have a list of a few things here to help us along. Well, Matt, oh, yeah, I will say that you can ask for a senior lid. Yeah. You don't have to get that kind. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you can definitely request that. Um, one thing um, one thing I find interesting as a pharmacist and something for healthcare professionals, um, it's very important, I think, to provide the pharmacist with a weight of the child, especially when we're talking about antibiotics, things are weight-based dosing, it would be very beneficial if, if the, care, if the uh, healthcare professional or the parent would give that information to the pharmacist when they're sitting there getting their prescription ready, if that pharmacist would do a second check. I have seen things come in, not always overdosing, but maybe sometimes underdosing, where the child is not going to have as much as they need to, to get better when the pharmacist can intervene, call, uh, get clarified. Um, another big problem, I think, and is making sure they understand the directions unit of measures. If someone sees on the bottle five milliliters, what does that mean? Does that mean a tablespoon? Does that mean a teaspoon? Do they know what a tablespoon is? That, do they know what a milliliter is? So to make sure that that person understands fully what they're giving their child is very important. So um, if you take care of children, very important. Um, Sometimes people 
person will, uh, you know, tell the child, oh, you don't want this, or it's candy, you know, or you take, one of the biggest things, do not take pills in front of a child, especially at such a young age that they think that they're, they're so, they love to imitate. They love to imitate uh, their parents and their grandparents, and uh, so one of the biggest things is try not to take uh, those medicines in front of them because they will think it's something that they can take too. Um, and never refer to it as candy. I know it seems silly, but they'll they'll think that they can eat that and it would be safe for them so that they don't like it. And there's um, so many good gummies. There are lots of good vitamin gummies nowadays. Yeah. I agree. Um, let's see. I think that pretty much sums that up. I think we should all have this number safe in our cell phones. Everyone got a cell phone nowadays pretty much. That's an important one. 911, they can forward you to poison control, but sometimes you don't, you don't, I mean, it's always call 911 if you think there's an accident of poisoning, but you can cause that, call that poison control number, and they can walk you through it. It might not seem like an absolute emergency at the time, um, if they're not having trouble breathing or seem unconscious or anything, so you might just call that number directly if you feel, uh, feel like it, but uh, as far as 911, they'll make sure that you're taken care of as well. Storage. Okay, so now on to another safety issue. Um, especially with children, even teens nowadays, if you have excess medicine from dental work, other things, uh, other medicines laying around the house, you'd be surprised the number of <coughs> teens and children that will accidentally take these medicines, but especially the teens that are you know, experimenting with these prescription drugs, and it's, it's such a huge problem. So don't just consider a five-year-old or a, you know, an elementary age person at risk of accidental, accidental exposure to these prescriptions and causing harm. And think about those teens that might not be using very good judgment at that point in their life, and really be conscious of that. You might be surprised, and it's usually you're not gonna see very many signs of that, so just try to keep an eye on your medicines. Um, Huge problem in America right now is opioid abuse. Opioids being uh, narcotics like hydrocodone, um, oxycontin, different things like that. Um, it has skyrocketed and thriving. Um, 437,000 emergency department visits in 2010 because of opioid abuse. Alcohol is also a usual culprit in that as well. A lot of the times that's going to cause respiratory depression and trouble breathing. Um, 28,000 deaths due to opioids in 2014, huge. That is more than uh, any uh, accidental deaths. Um, I think that is more than all other uh, illegal drugs combined in deaths. People think these prescription drugs are safe, but they are not necessarily safe, guys. You have to use them exactly how the doctor tells you to, or they can kill you. It's pretty, pretty dangerous stuff. <coughs> These drugs are basically the same as heroin. It's just a legal form of heroin. So you have to be careful about that. You hear about all these, um, you hear about this heroin epidemic in the north, northern parts of the states. A lot of times, people get started on these prescription drugs, and then they switch over to heroin, and it just is a horrible cycle. And we're really trying to figure out ways of of combating these issues. There's there's now a registry that uh, hospitals, and clinics, and pharmacies can pipe information into to see if someone has been shopping, doctor shopping, and other things. But, you know, it's a typical person to get wound up in being dependent on these medicines, and it's just really hard to beat. And if you need the help, try to reach out to someone. Um, it's not necessarily if you're gonna be in criminal trouble. We just need to give you some help to get you off these medicines. Uh, make that effort. People are willing to help you, definitely. Hey, Dan. Go ahead. Gina, on the uh, narcotic uh, registry, we have it back in our area. Do you want to briefly say something? Yeah. And, and quite often, they don't have to be able to get it. Yeah. Yeah.
great. We've, had, we've caught a couple of situations ourselves. Go ahead. I, can, I had a prescription for uh, hydrocodone, mm -hmm. and I had had back surgery, and I thought, okay, so it's four hours before I can take the next dose. And so in between those doses, I was taking Tylenol. Oh, I didn't know it had Tylenol in it. Right. So I ended up with Tylenol toxicity. Yes. Because it doesn't say on the bottle that it's got Tylenol in it. And a lot of times it'll say APAP, hey, which a lot of people know that what mean? that means. Mm -hmm. Correct. What, what's, what is APAP? That's, a, that's an abbreviation for acetaminophen, oh. which is the generic name for Tylenol. Well, yes, I, I only broke out in a rash, and I didn't have to go to the emergency room, but, it, you know, I thought, oh, geez, something's Very different. important to know, and that's also why they took all of the high Tylenol-containing hydrocodones off the market. There for a while you had, once it had 500 milligrams of Tylenol, once it had, I think, up to, uh, let's see, what was it? It was one about that. 700? 750. I think it was 750. It's been a while now. I have trouble remembering, but they did that because there was such an epidemic with people taking over-the-counter Tylenol and not understanding that or knowing that, that it made it even that much more safe to make sure they only had the ones that had 325 milligrams of Tylenol, which would be regular strength Tylenol with that hydrocodone. But that is very important. Now, you could possibly alternate with ibuprofen instead to try to prevent that, but the main, the main rule of thumb is people should not consume more than about 4 grams or 4,000 milligrams of Tylenol each day sometimes less. And to be on the safe side, I would honestly recommend more than 3 grams a day or 3,000 milligrams a day of Tylenol just to be on the safe side. But that's something to consult with your doctor to see if that's safe for you. Okay. Um, huge epidemic. The, the main point of this is we need to try to get some of this excess off the street as much as we can. There's proper drug disposal. They say you do not flush it into the water system anymore. Um, so the main thing you can do, and used to it was illegal for you to dispose of your narcotics at the pharmacy, uh, but there has been new laws that have uh, allowed that to take place. So you, you are allowed to take that to the pharmacy, and the pharmacy has to go through certain processes to dispose of that properly and uh, within you know guidelines so that it doesn't get diverted back out of the pharmacy into the population. But um, to make sure that it's completely taken care of. A lot of times you take that to a pharmacy. Sometimes hospitals will do it. Other places will do it. They just have to get set up to do it. Um, so we just need to make sure that you know that there are ways of getting rid of that besides flushing out the toilet to be safe. Um, let's see here. Benzodiazepines, uh, that's things like Xanax, Ativan, different things <laughs> like that. It's also a big uh, problem. So I just want to make sure everyone knows that um, something to do to help with our community. Proper drug destruction, like we were talking about. Okay, next topic. Since we're shooting um, pretty quick here. Transition to care um, is another huge safety, and I think these are all safety related, especially when it comes to hospitals and whatnot. Transition to care is super important right now, like we're talking about. What that means, and I will think this up there, but what this means is the process of going from home to hospital to nursing home back to the home or back to the nursing home or whatever it is there can be a lot of changes in some of the medicines particularly and um, there needs to be a better line of communication and there's been a lot of effort lately in, uh, in, in national uh, efforts to try to improve that there is a lot of time a breakdown when it comes to when, when you're sitting at a person at home especially there's a loss of communication between, uh, for instance, someone's at home, they are taking their normal medicines, they go in the hospital, the hospital changes a couple of medicines, they go back home, oh, they still have those two medicines that they were changed on back home, so they start taking those again, but they're now they're just taking the ones that they got in the hospital. So there's been a lot of times the duplicate therapy issues where um, things are interacting or they accidentally did not get prescribed something they needed. For instance, they had a heart attack, and they didn't get prescribed something that they really needed and they got home and, oh, they got readmitted after the 430 days and uh, there, there could be some issues there. So anyway, uh, lots of issues there. So one of the main things that I feel special <coughs> pharmacists can help with in, in my realm is 
helping with meditation reconciliation. And that's kind of a long word, but basically we're making sure that all the medicines match up correctly. Um, for instance, looking for errors such as drug-drug interactions, duplicate drugs, omissions, the affordability. Let's say someone gets discharged and they're given an expensive blood thinner and they were supposed to go home that day. They got home, they went to the pharmacy. The pharmacy said, oh, your insurance doesn't cover this. Um, and then they're having an issue getting that in that first three days out of the hospital is the most critical time to prevent the readmission. And now they can't get their medicine. So all these issues, uh, I, think, I think the best thing that can be done is whoever is handling the transition of care uh, program at the hospital, make sure that they are reaching out to the primary care physician. A lot of times that's easy here at our hospital because a lot of our primary care physicians here see people at this hospital. So they're usually in the loop, but also getting that community pharmacy in the loop where they're getting their prescriptions at home to make sure that we discontinue things off their chart at the pharmacy so they don't accidentally get filled. Uh, another thing is to make sure that when they got discharged, make sure there's no gaps in therapy, make sure everything lines up. I know a lot of times the patients get a discharge summary, which is great, but a lot of times the pharmacist never sees that, and we don't, and the patient a lot of times, I mean, they, they're explaining it at the hospital, I'm sure, but a lot of times they will forget it. It was, you know, um, and, and they, need, they need someone else to follow up with them after that. And I, I, some hospitals I know they will call and check up with the patient several days after their admission. But having that pharmacy also in the loop so that they know what's going on with that patient. They can also communicate with the patient, help follow up with them and make sure that they don't actually get readmitted before that critical time of 30 days, I think it really help. Um, we're, we're looking to possibly do some programs with the larger hospitals in Abilene too. Um, they have their injured professional pharmacy there. They uh, do a lot of this for customers or patients that come out of the, the hospital they uh, monitor them and make sure that they're doing okay within a certain amount of time to prevent readmission. So um, we send a lot of our uh, a lot of our patients out there. So to communicate with them as well, let them know that oh, you can rely on this pharmacy to help you with these patients to prevent them from coming back and getting if penalized. If we're all working together as a team, what about right. on the transitioning from you're talking about from hospital like home health? Home I mean, home health, I used to work in home health, and it is beneficial because you have RNs, LBNs that do, I mean, they start out usually however often, three to five times a week, and then they transition and slowly, you know, decrease right. the amount of visits. But Whether you're coming therapy. out of nursing home or you're coming out of hospital, mm -hmm. especially. Yeah, because everyone, I've talked to you several times when I've worked yes. in you know, home health, and I mean, I found it beneficial to a lot. I think it's very important for home health nurses to develop that relationship with pharmacists, especially. Uh, if you know something that I don't know, I didn't know that they came out of the hospital. <laughs> we, don't get we don't get notified of that stuff. Because they can continue time. with like therapy, physical, occupational speech. I mean, they have everything at the hospital has also. Definitely. Whenever that happens, it would be very beneficial to call the pharmacy. Let's review the medicines. Make sure that everything is kosher. Make sure that the patient doesn't accidentally feel something that is supposed to be discontinued. Yeah. I mean, think about, think about um, if they... The doctor, and this happened just the other day, the doctor changed them from Coreg or Carbetalol, mm -hmm. a heart lowering medicine, and then wanted mm -hmm. to start taking the propylol. Well, yeah, I've gone into home where they're on fentanyl pack, and, and, and then their blood pressure plummets, I mean. and then so there was a communication there. Maybe the pharmacy knew not to fill both at the same time, but the patient still had some at home. So mm -hmm. when they got home, they, they kept taking that other one, they got the new one, now they're taking too many, too much. So there's yeah. a lot of, there can be a lot of affordable issues. I think there were some statistics here real quick. Um, this is just talking about readmissions to the healthcare system. Uh, costs 25 billion annually. Uh, one in five elderly patients are readmitted within 30 days. So that's about 20% of the Medicare patients getting readmitted. Um, this, is, this is startling. This is, this is huge. Nearly one in three patients don't fill their discharge medications as prescribed. And especially for heart risk patients, that three day period, making sure you're taking the Plavix or the Duralto, that is the most.
most critical time, as soon as you get out of the hospital, you got to keep taking that, or you have a much higher risk of getting another, having another event, having to go back. And I know our hospital is really good on a lot of our scores, so that's great. But a lot of hospitals are losing tons of money. Um, a lot of a lot of these payments have they're now they're now uh, penalizing these um, hospital systems for high readmission rates, and they're getting like three up to three percent of their gross revenue, which I know as a healthcare company, three percent is probably all the profit at the end of the year if you even get that. So I know margins are real slim, but for hospitals, and three percent could be millions of dollars for some of these large hospitals, and it is huge. What we huge get deal. readmission rights every month. That is a, a benchmark that we follow because then it's exactly right. We are, we get a smaller reimbursement. <laughs> They're not paying for the person that's readmitted. They're paying for every Medicare patient. All gross revenue on every Medicare patient, am I correct? So for that whole for that whole year, they're getting that much lower reimbursement for all their patients because they had a higher than average uh, percentage of readmission. So it is huge. Yeah. And, and it's not just the
Otherwise, it becomes too time prohibitive for them to pick up the phone and call all day long. It becomes a huge mess. So really, it's the technology trying to catch up and all the different softwares communicating with each other and everything's got to be in the same uh, you know, format to communicate. So, But they're, they're trying. The government, the government has forced the system to get on track. It's the carrot and the stick, usually with government. Sometimes it's just a stick to do it or we'll find you. But there for a while, they were giving you certain incentives to go ahead and get started. But now it's turned into, oh, we're going to hit you over the head if you can't get the program. Yeah, now it's just a stick. Yeah, yeah, just a stick. It really is. Then what did you do on the first bill? Did you actually had those individuals? I know you were talking about What happens when you get to the point that individuals can't afford I know you say this. A lot of the time, uh, there can be some coupon programs and special programs uh, for high dollar minutes. We're mostly talking about high dollar brands that can be a real issue. A lot of times we can get the manufacturer to sign them up for special programs or do special coupons, at least temporarily, until the doctor can consider changing something. Um, as far as generics, you know, our pharmacy, we're, we're different than most. If it's a really cheap drug, someone can't afford it, I'm just going to make sure that they get that medicine and that they don't their safety until we can figure out some long-term issue. Um, but it's mostly changing the therapy if the insurance won't cover it. It's, it's a real issue nowadays. You know, the insurance, the insurance company, <laughs> they have a lot of power to uh, control the system. And uh, a lot of doctors are getting really fed up with it. So they're basically, a lot of doctors are now just doing whatever they tell them to do because it's just it's too time-consuming to have to hire two employees have to call the insurance all the time and trying to get your trust your patients the medicines that you're prescribing. It is terrible. You have to understand what we're in the same. Even with those patients we have that may have great commercial insurance, the doctor may want to admit them to the hospital and the insurance becomes the determined that it's not medically necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with medications and insurance. And so he's exactly right. We were just pawns these insurance. He's the insurance. And that's a different topic for another day. I talk about it for another day. Okay, let's see here. Oh, this is just a quick study that we found. Um, there's been a lot of studies. We're trying to demonstrate that pharmacists should get some type of compensation, possibly, to be able to help the system reduce a lot of costs. This uh, study was a randomized trial that um, pharmacists that intervened helped with the, um, helped with, uh, remind me, it was to uh, make sure that they understand the di di diagnosis or medications and that everything was reconciled and they were showing the reduction of 30% in readmissions, the, uh, the ones that you want to prevent, that 30 day readmission rate. So that's actually a pretty, uh, pretty impressive mm -hmm. number there having it, the pharmacist involved. Um, let's see here. There's some statistics on the reports. Look at that last medication. There, there, there are huge numbers at stake. There's, there's huge numbers at stake. So we're trying to forever pharmacists that have paid just to fill the prescription. We're, we're not paid to spend the time with the, the uh, patient to make sure that, I mean, if we, we, we have a pharmacist spend 30 minutes to an hour discussing this transition care process, not just filling the prescription, but going through that and having to call the doctor and having changes made and everything, there's, there's no payment method for the uh, pharmacy pharmacists directly now. So a lot of these studies that are being done lately are to try to help us as a profession to uh, show our value to the uh, government, basically. Okay, let's see. I think we've discussed a lot of this. Besides transition to care, trying to remain adherent 
to your medicines as prescribed. So for instance, you let me let me back up just a little bit. Pharmacy nowadays, it's just like Ted's situation with the hospital and Medicare and them wanting to pay for, for pay for performance. Pharmacy now, instead of just getting paid by prescription, we're starting to get just dinged up front. They take away a certain amount of money and say, okay, good luck, try to earn it back. And what, what they do is they say, well, depending on how coherent your patients are to the medications, we will give you some of your money back. So they're trying to incentivize pharmacies to engage their patients better to promote them taking their medications as prescribed. So instead of their patients taking their diabetes medicine 50% of the time, let's see if you can get it up to 80% of the time give you some of that money back if you can try to help promote that with your customers. Now, a lot of times out of our control, um, what, what we, what we, uh, what we're, we're doing our best, and we're working with some of those customers right on the edge of, you know, being on that 70% adherent, maybe we can get them up to 90%, people that we can really make a difference with, um, and then really kind of counsel a lot of those people. Let's say it's a diabetes patient taking metformin, they hate the you know, bloating and everything, maybe they just cannot tolerate that formin. So the pharmacist just needs to talk to them and say, hey, can you not tolerate this? Maybe we need to think about changing it. So we get them on something else and maybe they're to be more adherent to something else. So just help, it really, I think it's great because it's really helped our, our pharmacists and our company focus in on the patient care aspects and the outcomes aspects. So this is huge for us, for adherence and for helping you get better and uh, helping prevent great uh, admissions to hospitals that are avoidable admissions. Now, that's not always good for the bottom line for a hospital, but you know, over, over the long run, I hope that most of this, these compensations will go toward, let's see how good you are at managing your population in Eastland County. Let's, let's try to prevent the admission from happening in the first place. And uh, so instead of just getting paid for the admission, getting paid to prevent Admissions period. Uh, so, hospitals engaging in that as far as community health, which is part of what they're doing here today, is trying to educate your community. Okay, let's see here. So, what are we doing? And I'm not trying to promote our company necessarily, but I just want you to know kind of some of the things that you can do to help adherence. So, what we're doing is a big one. Is Medication synchronization. So you can imagine a customer having to come into the pharmacy multiple times a month because they they get multiple medicines and it's hard to coordinate coming in multiple times a month because it's always too early to go on, on your insurance. You can't fill all your medicines once a month because it's too early for insurance, too early for insurance. So what the pharmacy does is we coordinate with your doctor, we get special quantity prescriptions to help line up the refills together so we can fill them all once a month. And a lot of the times, there's no extra, there's no extra charge as far as copays. Copays are reduced because you're getting less pills at one time to get them lined up together. And so we can help coordinate to get all of your refills filled once a month all together. And then along with that, we help people take it at the right time of the day, the right day of the week, instead of uh, having someone fill up their own pill box and <coughs> maybe accidentally getting out of order or spilling on the floor or accidentally taking too many of some. We have a new packaging right here, and I'll pass this around. Um, we're able to, we have this new robot. It was pretty expensive. But we're, but we're trying to keep the service free. We're trying to improve our adherence so much and gain enough new customers that we're able to break even on the uh, equipment and try to promote this new wave of healthcare where we're becoming all about outcomes. And we're really focusing in on helping our patients take the medicine exactly how the prescriber um, wants. And uh, I'll pass this around. Go ahead. On the one, can you put OTCs in there as well? Can't put OTCs? Okay, second thing. So like I did my mom's pill box. So right. And she's like not compliant people. Right. So at the end of the month, if she has like five or six days that she hasn't taken, do we just move those or is it an option to bring them back and just repackage? You can bring them back and if you repackage, you'd be ready. And if, if, if you can talk with your loved one enough to be able to say, okay, let's save these till the end of the 
But this way, it's completely, on, on here, it's completely customized. You have the day that you're to take it, the time you're to take it, your name, the drug, the prescription number, um, the doctor, what it looks like in there, how many you're supposed to take at that time. It also has a little symbol for morning or night. So it is basically, and you can also imagine, it's really cool. And I love it. And uh, all the prescriptions are on time. They can all be organized for them. 8 a.m., 8 p.m. Also, if you're headed out of town for the day, you just you know, rip off your day's work or your week's work or whatever you want to do. It's all compliant with travel and uh, other agencies. Just fill it up, put it in your pocket, head out the door for the day. You got all your medicines there. The doctor needs to know what prescriptions you're on. Take your box, take your day's worth, and you can say, hey, here's the prescriptions I'm on. So your doctor has no guesswork of what, you, what you're on. Now, the things we don't put in there, things like pain medicines you might want to take on a schedule, you can put recommended pain medicines in there, but things like, things you wouldn't take every day necessarily, or take it more infrequently, or just as needed, we would keep out of there. Um, but it's scheduled. I mean, it's we, scheduled. we had someone who took vitamin D once a week. So there was one packet once a week, you know, for the four weeks that you had it invited me in there. Because you can the time it's probably going to be unless you want to take it to your If there's someone it's that's up and down with their medication, because uh, we've had some patients that are in and out of the hospital while we're trying to synchronize them and package them, we told them, let's get you synced first, let's get you on a scheduled medication dose before we, you know, package you. And we can also do it, you know, let's say they need to package and do it in a two-week time span or something like that so that, you know, you don't have to rip open each package and see the open package. So, um, you know, to put it back in the top. Yeah, they're, they're, their messages are fluctuating a lot. Yeah. It might not be ideal for them at that time. But hopefully, if they're very stable, this is a very ideal thing to help them take their medicines. And imagine taking care of your loved one at home. They're forgetful. I don't know if I took that. Well, you don't know if your loved one took it either. Well, you can see, okay, well, this is the day and the time. I know they didn't take it, or they know they didn't take it, so they can go ahead and take it. Uh, so it's, it's very, uh, that's a great service. It's very cool. And we're doing it for free. We're trying to bring in new people and go ahead. If, if I went on that, yes. then you know how many times I have to call you. Yes. So at the end of my prescription, we automatically <laughs> yes. tell them that what we do, every time. and I like the word proactive. Mm -hmm. Instead of a pharmacy just being reactive, only doing things when they're called or they're prompted by the patient, we're going to be more proactive. So people that are engaged in, in this product, what we do is we call. We're, we're trying to we're trying to develop our process to solidify our processes right now. But we're going to be calling you probably a week ahead of time, asking. Have you been to the doctor in the last month? Has there been any changes? Are you anticipating any changes? That way, we have this done plenty of time. You always have all the refills you need because we're calling ahead of time. And so it really makes it simple. Once a month, um, you never have to be blown pills again because you're never out of refills by mistake or the doctor has not responded yet. So there, it can fix so many problems. And uh, so the pharmacy is just more active helping you with your medicines and it, it's great too for me because when I sit down to fill all your medicines once a month I see everything you're taking all at once you're doing a comprehensive medication review for every single medicine they're taking and it's nice to see the whole regimen in front of you when you're a pharmacist and see okay I know that's for that that's for that oh they're taking that medicine probably that for the side effect of the other one maybe we should change something here. so there's lots of there's lots of great benefits when we get the call, will it be the robot or Wilma? I'm working, yeah. Maybe Wilma. I'm working on having it be Wilma. That's what I want to do. That way, we can communicate a lot better and not just have you be sent back to the pharmacy uh, through the automated system. The death of Wilma. Can you I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, can you tell me, like, glimpizide, metformin, how much is a month? I mean, can, yeah, like if I were to refill or to get a prescription in, in your business, yeah. how much is it about? Well, you have insurance. I have person. insurance. Insurance should be the same price wherever you go, typically. Really? Typically. Now, there are some 
insurances that have preferred networks. And we're trying our best to get in as many of those as we can. But there's a lot of dirty, you know, business out there with these large companies trying to force small independents and other pharmacies out so they can try to steal as much money as they can or steal as much business as they can away from other businesses. So we're trying our best to have a uh, pharmacy, if they're willing to accept the contract, they're allowed to be in that preferred network so you get that preferred copay. So sometimes there could be a copay difference depending on the plan. But we try our best to try to get in every plan that we can and we're working legislatively to allow independents especially to be able to gain access to those preferred networks, preferred copays, to make sure there's no financial incentive to move your business away from an independent just because they're not allowed in your network. So we're trying our best. But most cases, like for us, we're a preferred pharmacy with Silver Script and Caremark, which is a very common plan. So we are in lots of preferred plans as well, but we're trying to have it all opened up for everybody. So it should be the same price and no extra charge for all of that. We have about five or six minutes. What else are you doing? So I, I love your organic section. Yes. Various things. So. We're, the focus of our business, we really uh, want to focus in on the total wellness of a, of a patient. A lot of times that means body, mind, and spirit. So we're doing everything we can to help that person as a whole. And uh, you know, people that are lost, sick, hurting, um, depressed, you know, we're, we're trying to be there for them. We try to make sure we're providing good uh, quality foods. Um, we are also focused on making our cafe a little bit more healthy lately. So we're going to work, be working on our uh, menu. And um, another really a uh, fun thing that we're about to start is um, we're going to get a accredited diabetes education program, Medicare accredited program. There's nobody accredited in the county, and there's a real gap. There's a lot of diabetes in our area. Um, the diabetes education, I just have a quick statistic here, but uh, diabetes self-management education was shown to reduce their A1Cs by at least 0.6%. Um, I would think that, you know, I might get to do really a little better than that. But um, what that means is uh, we would be able to build, our pharmacy would be accredited to do diabetes education. We'd be able to build Medicare to do one-on-one -on -one classes and the group sessions. And uh, so we're hoping to uh, gain a lot of referrals and try to really help the most, that, that can be a real challenging uh, condition to try to uh, get on track. It's a three-legged school. It's the medicine, but it's also the lifestyle, the diet, the exercise. And uh, so uh, medicine only gets you there about 50% of the way. And uh, so an exercise to the Kinsey? Yes. <laughs> so we're really hoping to party with people on some of the education and uh, diabetes and, and health, total health. And uh, so we're having a lot of fun. Been a lot of changes this last year, but we're finally getting the story shape, I think. So we're having a good time. Please don't get rid of your own shapes. Yeah. <laughs> Still, but what I really want to do is to start is, is have a choice and have that Mediterranean uh, menu option, and you can't get that around here. That there's fresh ingredients, um, that Mediterranean diet has been shown to have very good, um, very good outcomes. So that's that's why I'm choosing a lot of those menu items. And so we're looking at good, healthy fats, the fats that don't make you gain weight, the olive oils, the uh, you know fish and other things. Avocados, you know, those are all those those fats that help you stay full, but don't uh, let you gain weight. Things that are a little bit lower carbohydrate, keeping those car carbohydrates portioned to about one cup per serving. So we're really looking at developing that. So people that really want to get healthier and need that quick option because they didn't have time to make uh, lunch that day, well, they can come over to our place. They know they can get a healthy meal, and then we can uh, our whole business will be focused on it. That's what we're going for. And that's pretty much it. I don't know if anybody has any more questions, but if you do that, you're going to be selling a lot of drugs. <laughs> I know. That's the only thing about it. No, no, too healthy. You'd be surprised, though. Uh, there, there's. I, I'd rather be selling people vitamins and the the 
groceries to help keep them better and stay off the prescriptions than selling the prescriptions. And there's still there's still a good business with that. So we're we're really wanting to make sure people stay healthy. It's better for you. It's good for us. And we're we're in it together. With her team. If you can do this with the medicine, yes. Um, I'll never have to sit foot in Walmart. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really simple. Easy. Do they have to have any prescription for the doctor to do that? The diabetic teaching thing? Uh, you don't have to. Uh, that's a good question. I'll have to look. I'll look more into that. They might have to have a referral for us to build. But I'll. I'll double check. I know we'll have to find that out. Um, they I have a lot of cardiac patients that don't know if I'm okay, so We're also probably going to have a heart health program as well. A heart health program. Especially people with congestive heart failure, you know, big time. So we're going to have the diabetes education, the heart health. We're probably going to have some type of weight loss class as well. We won't be able to bill insurance for that, so they probably have to pay a little bit for that. But uh, we're going to work on that. Oh, there's some moving that can be